Welcome to Capital Gains Tax Solutions Podcast, where we believe most high net worth individuals and those who help them struggle with clarifying their capital gains tax deferral options. Not having a clear plan is the enemy, and using a proven tax deferral strategy is the best way to grow your wealth. I'm your host, Brett Swartz. Each episode, I'm joined by some of the best financial independence and passive income wealth advisors in the world, where they share their ideas, deal stories, and inspiration, so together we can make complex tax deferral strategies simple and passive income plans achievable. I'm excited about our next guest here. Um, You know, many real estate investors, they really struggle with reducing capital gains tax, uh, but also tax savings when it comes to owning commercial real estate or businesses. Our next guest is a a cost segregation specialist, and together with his team at Madison Specs, they help property and business owners save millions of dollars every single year. In fact, over the past 14 years, Madison Specs and our guest has has done um, over 15,000 cost segregation studies covering all 50 states, resulting in over $3 billion in tax savings. Um, So please welcome with me, Yana Weiss. Thank you very much, Brett. It's a pleasure to uh, a pleasure to be on the show, and uh, happy to, you know, be able to share some of my knowledge with your listeners. Absolutely, we're looking forward to diving in. And by the way, you can learn more about Yana. Um, he also has his own podcast, which I'm going to have him just plug right now. But you can also learn more at MadisonSpecs.com. That's MadisonSpecs.com. And, and, and Yana, what podcast are you on right now? You just launched one, I believe, right? Just launched one a few weeks ago. We only actually have recorded one episode thus far, but it's called Higher Profits with Bobby and Yona. And um, I'm actually in the process of launching another podcast on my own. Uh, I'm just getting some recordings done before actually launching, and that's called Weiss Advice. So that's going to be launching uh, probably at the beginning of 2020. Weiss advice. I like that uh, that play on words there. You know, it's like wisdom and Weiss and all wrapped, in, wrapped into one there. So let's get started here. So uh, will you give our listeners a little bit about your about your story and then, and then your current focus? So just a brief about my story. I actually have a background in teaching. I spent about uh, two decades, close to two decades, teaching various levels, you know, all the way from literally kindergarten to all the way up to uh, post-collegiate uh, levels. And I have six children, so every day is teaching, right? Every day is, is part of education. And that's really my passion, which for whatever reason led me to real estate about five years ago when I started to learn everything there was about real estate, just got really fell in love with it and everything there was to do with it. And one thing led to another, really got involved as a brokerage and commercial mortgages and literally kind of fell into this position with Madison Commercial Real Estate, the company I work for now, and Madison Specs, the specific cost segregation division. And I found basically what I'm doing is just teaching about cost segregation. And I'm, you know, the business director. So I'm able to, you know, work on the business development and teach people about something that most people don't even know about. Yeah, you're, you're in the business of educating and helping people out. You started out as a teacher and now it's, it went into real estate and then in particular cost segregation. So when when you joined Madison Specs, was did you join as, you look, I want to be a cost segregation specialist or how, how did that progression go where, where you actually said, okay, now I'm going to specialize in focus. What was that? What was that uh, so Madison Specs is one of the industry leaders in the United States for cost segregation. So we have a whole team of engineers and accountants who have been doing this for decades. And they're really the experts in the field. And I literally just wanted to soak up everything from them so that I could be able to, to, to give it over. And that's what I found is a lot of people don't, very few people, a very small percentage of people and probably your listeners now also don't really understand cost segregation. And most people wonder, well, it's tax related, so it must be my accountant is taking care of this. And I'm sure you, you know, you come across this quite often as well, Brett. And that's just unfortunately not the case. So to be able to educate people about something they can kind of take into their own hands, which is their taxes, which is their really not their taxes, their income. Because in the end of the day, we're discussing income tax, which is, uh, you know, depreciation, cost segregation, 
is an income tax saving more than anything. Uh, it can save capital gains as well. But the main thing is income tax. So it's your income. People have this misconception that if I make income, I have to pay tax on it. And that's part of the, uh, I would say the corporate uh, structure that you get taxes deducted from your paycheck even before you see see the money you made. And the truth is with real estate, there's so many deductions that you can create that you can literally keep all of your income. And so it's really yours. And so again, not God forbid to say, you know, don't pay your taxes if you're obligated, but just know that making money does not mean that you have to pay tax on it if you don't have that tax liability. Yeah, and I, it makes me think of the traditional educational system where we, we sort of grow up thinking that there's one way to do things or only a couple ways to do things, and anything outside of that box can kind of really shatter the uh, the thought process of what it means to to do something new, right? But, right. The, but the reality is that the government gives these legal tax loopholes to incentivize business growth, job growth, um, and, and, and the study of macroeconomics shows that when you do these things, you actually, they actually end up getting more tax revenue and uh, more jobs created, more properties built, more businesses started, all of those things. So they, it, they actually want you to do this because it helps to, to bring in more. So it's actually a win, win, win. So backing up a little bit more, Yana, before, before your success as an educator um, <laughs> and what you're doing now, who are you growing up? And in particular, how did that sh what gifts were you given? Okay, what gifts were you given and how did that shape how you help others today? So I want you to connect um, gifts that you were giving as, as a youngster, right? As growing up, you know, uh, adolescence and then connecting now exactly what you're doing as an educator. And if, if for somehow you can connect the cost segment, that would be even more, more magical. But w give, us that, give us that idea of who you were growing up. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a great uh, perspective. And I'm very grateful you know, I really grew up with uh, a lot of gifts and I think, you know, a lot of us did. We take for granted and, you know, looking back, you know, decades in the past to try to figure out, you know, where, where did I come from? How did I become who I became? I think one of the gifts that I only really realized a little bit later in life into, into what was about like 18, 19, 20 years old, I realized I had this really powerful gift of learning uh, things. And I think it came with education as I started to get into teaching, I realized, hey, I wasn't so great at school, so to speak, because I didn't necessarily like the subjects. I wasn't really into certain things. And maybe the teachers weren't the best. And there were certain subjects, I'm sure all of us have excelled in more than others. But when I started teaching, I realized that, wow, I can really integrate this knowledge and give it over in a way to help other people understand. And that was something that I, I really tapped into. And I think that's one of my greatest gifts until today, which is I can learn something, something very new, even complicated and integrate it very fast uh, and be able to give it over in a simplified uh, way. So I'm not going to get into too many other things of gifts because uh, there are so many. It's <laughs> We can go on for hours, but I think that's, if I had to pull out one thing, that would be it. Excellent. So if you found something that was interesting to you, then you could really dive in and learn about it, especially if it happened to be complex and that actually, and then once you were able to, you know, break it down, understand it, inspire and educate others that give you more inspiration. Exactly. Excellent. No, that's great. Um, now after helping countless investors, business owners, interviewing many financial advisors and also being on lots of different shows. You get interviewed quite a bit on, on, on commercial real estate podcasts and you speak at lots of events. What is the single best practice and or theme uh, to implement for building uh, uh, real estate investing or building, I'm sorry, uh, building your real estate portfolio and or just building wealth through real estate? So the, your question, the single best practice for building real estate and building your portfolio that I found <laughs> being yes. involved in the industry. Yeah. Um, establishing a strong team. A strong team, meaning it's funny because I actually spoke with someone today and this was almost a unique perspective. And this guy said that 
he's worked you know with partners and and he only does deals on his own <laughs> like only does deals on their own. and i i found that you know most of real estate is like a team effort and so there are a lot of people can bring their talents and partner up with other people you know through the humility of being able to recognize that you know i can't do everything on my own and we can actually do so much better together and that's really the definition of synergy right is that on my own i can only do so much but together we can do so much more um so i think that's the the number one component building a strong team and I'm curious how does how does how does madison specs done that within the organization and, and 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 i don't know if you've applied it to your own personal portfolio of real estate investing any connections there sure absolutely so you know from our company perspective we have a, a team of about 60 uh six zero individuals so we have a team of engineers we have accountants uh you know whole operations team we have a sales team you know and everyone kind of works together each person has their own job and, and it really kind of flows there's a lot of fluidity to to keep i mean if you think about the operation we've done in 2019 we've done over 2500 you know 2500 conservation studies this year alone which is you know pretty incredible if you think about the volume of of doing that especially if you understand what is involved in, in producing a conservation report you know and reviewing it we review it at least four times so we have a numerous accountants we're reviewing everything making sure that everything is totally compliant so yeah there is definitely a team effort there and i would say because of that team you know the accountants the executives who are so knowledgeable in the industry are open you know all the time you know if i have any questions about anything i have any anything's come up in the actual you know process they're they're right there available anytime um so in my own Excellent. personal yeah, so your role yeah. knowing your role yeah, exactly Keep going. sorry <laughs> yeah no so knowing your role and knowing what you can give and doing that to you know the ultimate like doing your part putting it all all effort in and then for your personal personal real estate holdings or or investing with partners how, what's your strategy there and how how have you implemented the team team approach so similar so i did a little bit of uh investing on my own uh sing, single family fix and flips a number of years ago and that was with a partner and it was great so i really loved that because we each had different roles you know in terms of the asset management the actual you know on the grounds versus i was more involved with the you know the capital raising and you know involved with the kind of underwriting aspects of it so that was beneficial to have someone else who could be involved in the day-to-day -day on the ground kind of boots on the ground which I didn't like so much and now you know coming back full circle I'm getting into investing in multifamily with some partners and same thing I have people who are good at what they're good at and each one of us can bring to the table something else excellent excellent so now let's get to the practical part here so we really want to help the listener understand what a cost segregation study is and how it actually can save uh taxes not only on the passive income but active income um so maybe let's start with what's a cost segregation study how does it defer taxes on let's say capital gains tax and or passive or active all of them kind of kind of segment each each of that if you could and, and maybe just actually do a live deal you know let's let's try to maybe do a deal that was i don't know uh the recent four million dollar deal or recent five or two million dollar you pick one just, just do a live deal let's walk through kind of how that worked sure so someone will purchase in a you know, let's say any type of property can work for cost segregation but you know let's take an apartment building that's one of the most popular things people are investing in nowadays uh for even before that let me take a step back because maybe people don't understand what depreciation is what cost segregation is you may do you may but let me just describe that for one brief minute that depreciation please, please is do. a income tax deduction which means you can write off the value of the building that you purchase you can literally write off the entire value of that less the land which is a small amount as a tax write off but you can't do it all at once mm -hmm. the IRS uh, gave a lifespan uh, for commercial properties of 39 years or residential and multifamily properties for 27 and a half years so that means you can take the entire purchase price of that building uh, again subtract a small amount for land value and write that off literally for the next 27 and a half years 
you know, take that $4 million building and you're looking at about $120,000 a year for 27 years of a tax deduction. That means immediately from your income tax, you, um, you know, for your income, excuse me, you immediately deduct that 120,000 and you're only taxed on the remaining amounts. So that's what depreciation is. Cost segregation is a really cool way of depreciating the property that according to the IRS rules, a lot of things in the property, in the building, depreciate on a faster life, meaning you can write the value of those assets off at a faster life, not just 27 years, but actually five years or seven years or 15 years. And so cost segregation involves an engineer who is well versed in the tax code to come into a property, take a site visit and alloc identify all of those tiny details, literally every tiny detail of what's in the property from the carpeting to the cabinets, you know, to fixtures, to appliances, furniture, uh, window treatments, electrical outlets, et cetera, all of that stuff, uh, come up with a valuation of those things and then be able to take that tax write off uh, in the first five years or first 15 years earlier on, and front load a bunch of those tax savings. So it's, it's essentially creating larger tax deductions earlier in the ownership of the property. And okay. So, so, so it'd be like for the 120,000, instead of doing that once a year for 27 and a half years, you might have four or 500,000 in the, in, in the first few years. And then it, then it might be, you know, two, two or 300. It's essentially going to be the same number. You're just getting the time value of money because you're getting it all up front rather than having to wait again, 27 and a half years to get that full benefit. Is that a, is that a good summary? Correct. You're front loading a certain portion of that to take that benefit in the early years of the ownership. Correct. Excellent. So let's walk through an actual scenario. So get, get, walk me through, you know, so-and-so bought this property for this amount and, and they could have had 120 per year, but instead they did our cost seg study and they had X. Can you give us kind of a, a, a deal yeah, that you close for sure. without sharing any names or any, any, no, of course. any, any confidential stuff? Yeah. And I'll, you know, I'll just give a, um, you know, example, let's say you have a, like your example, $4 million apartment building. Okay. Let's say we take allocate 15% to land, okay, which is pretty, you know, in most places in the United States, I wouldn't say everywhere, but a lot of places that's a pretty average number. So you're left with remaining, you know, approximately, let's say 4 million, uh, approximately $3.4 million of depreciable basis. That means that amount you would have been able to take, again, $120,000 every year for 27 years to get to your 3 million, $3.4 million write off. Instead, an engineer will come in and typically on, you know, um, this type of, you know, an apartment building, a garden style apartment will typically be around 20% will be allocated to five year property. Meaning the engineer will come to the property, will take a site, you know, visit, go into each unit type. So it actually doesn't have to go into every single unit, does not have to disturb all of your tenants, but according to the IRS rules for multifamily specifically, can just go into one of each unit layout type and use those findings to apply to the rest because they're usually the same. And all the common areas walk the property at perimeters and find also the land improvements that depreciate on a 15 year schedule. So he's gonna come back and take all those findings, pictures, right, notes, measurements, and prepare a report. He'll find typically around 20%, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. So we're talking about 20% of your $3.4 million is about $680,000 of extra depreciation. So you're already getting your 120,000 every year. Okay. Um, and then in the first five years, you know, you're taking an extra $136,000 every single year of depreciation. And that's how the cost segregation works. So in the first five years, you're basically doubling or more than doubling your tax deductions. And with the new tax law of bonus depreciation, you can actually take the entire amount in year number one, which means you don't have to wait five years or 15 years to take, accelerate or front load, if you will, those extra, those tax deductions, you can literally front load the entire amount in year number one, which we're talking about taking that entire $680,000 deduction, uh, as well as the 15 year property, which I didn't, you know, describe in quite detail, but you know, talking literally on a $4 million purchase, 
potentially a million dollars of tax write off in year number one. So let's walk through that for a second. Let's imagine I'm a high net worth individual and I make a million dollars a year at either my W two job, but I have some investment real estate and let's let's assume I I, I qualify as a real estate professional, right? I've spent at least, I think it's 750 hours per, per year and I'm a probably a general partner. I'm, I'm actively owning and managing or operating this property. So walk us through, if I made a million, let's say on my W-2 job or collectively with real estate, are you saying that that million could offset and I would have a zero tax bill or what am I missing there, Yana? Yeah, you're, you're pretty much right on that. And so how it works is that if someone is a real estate professional, okay, they or their spouse, okay, it's either or, which is the great thing. You can be a high income earner and your spouse can be a real estate professional, meaning be materially involved in the real estate business in one form or another um, and owning properties, especially if you're a general partner, you can take the depreciation deductions to not only offset the passive income, meaning the rental income, but then it carries over and can offset all of your active income as well. Um, so yeah, if, if you are just a limited partner on and you are not a real estate professional, so the depreciation deductions are limited to your passive income. That means income from rental income from this property or other properties as well. And that depreciation can offset that. But the real bang for the buck is when you're the real estate professional, can literally knock off their entire tax liability. Yeah, that is, uh, th those are one of the times where you say, wow, that sounds too good to be true, of which <laughs> yeah. Yana would say, you know, we've done thousands of these. It, the tax law has been around for, for you know, decades. Um, we save millions and billions of dollars. So it does, does work and it just, but it does take a specialist like Yana, Manis and Specs, walking you through that. Every circumstance is a little bit different. So you want to definitely connect with him for your individual circumstance and also connect with your CPA and make sure everyone's working together as a team that you're taking care of. So next question, Yana, would be this. Well, what if I only make 500,000, you know, and I had this million, does that 500 roll over to the next year or how does that work? So that can be used if you're the real estate professional or even if you're not and you have more deductions than you have income, then that creates what's called a passive loss. And that is essentially a negative um, on your tax return, but what it doesn't go away. So it carries forward with you in future years. And essentially it's like creating an imaginary bank account that that passive loss gets stored in and carries forward into the future years. And so you can use that uh, in next year to offset the income or in the current year, if you were to have, and I guess this is really more connected to what your podcast is all about, uh, potentially can use to be offset capital gains taxes as well which means if a person you know, has a sale of a property or has a capital gain, they can create the, the extra deductions and then use those to, to offset those gains. Excellent, now nuanced question here. Mm -hmm. If I don't use it in that first year, let's say for my active income, that million, right? And instead I use 500 the next year and it turns into passive carry forward loss, right? I think that's what it's right. covering. Does do, do I forfeit using it for my W-2 income and it has to only be real estate passive related or walk us through that? Does, is it get, is it, in other words, is it, get, is it getting recharacterized? And if it is, does that mean I can't use it for my regular W-2 job? If the person is a real estate professional, so it's going to carry forward and be used across the board um, as well. Uh, if a person or their is spouse, in, right. Or their spouse. If it's not, if you are not a real estate professional, then it's still care, it still will be only able to be used against the passive income. Okay, great. So it doesn't necessarily recharacterize. Um, uh, uh, if you're a real estate professional, it's going to stay that same. You can do it for active or passive W-2 income or passive income moving forward. But if you don't have the real estate professional, then it's always just going to be for passive income, real estate investment, or biz or would it be business income too? Um, or how does that break down if, if I'm, I'm self-employed and a business owner? Um, so only a passive income would be able to use that depreciation. So if you may have shares, you may okay. have uh, ownership in, an, uh, in a business, but aren't actively involved in it. So that would be considered a passive income. 
Perfect. Thanks for sharing that. Now, the next, I think the next most obvious question I think our listeners would have is, what's the aftermath? In other words, when does this tax catch up with me, Anna? Like, what's the what's the what's the exit plan? You know, so walk us through what some what some of the strategies to to uh, not get you know hammered by the capital gains tax recapture or depreciation recapture. Walk us through uh, navigating that. Absolutely. So when you sell a property, you have, besides with capital gains tax, right? If you sell that property at a profit, you also have another tax, which is called depreciation recapture tax, which means that you have to now pay a tax on the amount of depreciation that you took. Now that might sound like, well, why would I want to accelerate and take a lot more depreciation right now when I'm just going to have to pay tax on it later? If I would have taken regular depreciation, I would have, I would pay less tax later on. So there's really a couple of strategies around that. And the main thing to understand here is that, like you mentioned earlier, Brett, the time value of money of what cost segregation does, which is keeping your money and using your money, not paying taxes today and worrying about the taxes I may have to pay in the future. So it's the time value that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar five years from now. And again, it's your money in the first place. So there's no obligation to pay it now if you don't have to. That's kind of the backdrop of this. But the strategies that one can do is number one, um, I'm sure most people are familiar with a 1031 exchange, which can further defer the capital gains tax on the sale of a property. And it also further defers the depreciation recapture tax as well. So that's one thing that you're not concerned about when you're selling a property about this depreciation recapture. The second thing, strategy would be is something called the partial asset disposition. Now, when you replace, when you dispose of a property, either by replacing it, uh, putting in something new, right? Replacing your you know, cabinets and putting in new cabinets or selling a property, disposing of the entire property, you can actually, there's a tax form that allows, you know, law in, in the tax code that allows you to allocate a lesser value to those items that have a shorter depreciation life, uh, like exactly what we're doing with the cost segregation is allocating and identifying all that personal property that has a value to it and depreciates on a five year schedule. Well, guess what? If you know, after a year you did the cost segregation and you identified your cabinets and the cabinets have a value in this apartment complex of $50,000, let's say, okay. Just throwing out a random number in our $4 million property. Um, you replace those cabinets, you can write off the value of that, meaning this partial asset disposition allows you to say, I am no longer, you know, that's no longer on the books of depreciation. And so it's gone. And I take that as a tax write off, whatever value is left. And there's obviously less value to it in year number one or year number four or year number five than there is in the day that you bought it. Okay. Same thing when you sell a property, when you sell that property five years from now, or more, and you've allocated from a tax perspective, it's been fully depreciated. It has no more tax value to it. So you can literally write it off and allocate a lesser value to that $50,000 cabinets. You can literally allocate $1,000 to to that. And so the depreciation recapture tax on that is only going to be, you know, the 25% on that um, $1,000 as opposed to the $50,000. Okay, so there's a 1031 exchange, which you could just exchange and defer everything when you buy a bigger property, and, and you just maintain that, maintain that deferral until and if you sell eventually and it recaptures. However, you can also do what's called a partial asset disposition, where you're going to allocate lesser value on certain, certain portions of whatever you've accelerated over the years, such as cabinets. And if you do that correctly, you, you maybe you only get hit with 25% of the recapture. Is that a fair summary? Um, no, probably much, much less than that. I'd say, I would say literally, you know, you can, depending on how long you hold the property for, but literally, you know, 5% or 10% of that recapture. Okay. And curious for your clients are most doing the 1031 strategy or are they doing the partial or what's partial asset disposition or what's, what's, is it 50, 50, 70, 30, what percentage are doing, which I I can't really say what, you know, what percentage are doing what I do know that a lot of them 
uh, our partnerships and a lot of our syndications. And so 1031 is a little more complicated when you're going down that route and not necessarily uh, taking that into account. But um, a lot, and this is pretty much across the board strategy of the partial asset disposition. So uh, I would say Got it. a large, large percentage do that. And in fact, you know, the, all, the big four, I mean, this is not like some just crazy tax strategy, the big four, right? All of the tax, they all use this, meaning it's not something that is just like this crazy tax strategy. This is something that accountants who earn real estate know about and use this to, you know, lessen the, you know, the burden and some, and I'm even do it after one year, meaning, yeah, after five years, that five year asset, it's very easy to say and to claim that that has no value. After one year, it would be much more aggressive to say that, you know, these cabinets after one year have no more value. Um, but there are accounting mm-hmm. firms um, that actually do that. So there's definitely what to work with. I see. Right. So you you, do, you may want to be, if you're on the conservative side, say, look, if it's five years for these cabinets, generally speaking, that's that's a useful life then or whatever component you're, 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 you're accelerating, you may not want to take it all in one year for the partial asset dis- disposition. You may want to wait till five, but there's some that will take it in two, three, four, five, just kind of depending on their level of, of, of risk that they want to um, test the IRS, if you will, right? Exactly. Exactly. And some people were Excellent. comfortable with that, you know? Absolutely. Now, what about for the 1031? For those who do the 1031, you know, the cost basis travels, right? So this might be more of the individual investor who's not in the partnership, has done the cost segregation, and is continuing to do the 1031 exchange. But right. part of the 1031, when you sell or, or, or you take you take depreciation, either straight line or accelerate it, that's going to lower your basis, right? And eventually, if you own long enough, you may fully depreciate or take enough cost segregation. So then when you sell, the basis travels. So you walk through what the strategy might be there because they say, well, yeah, that's great. I took all this accelerated depreciation, but now I just bought a new property. My basis is so low, you know, um, I don't see, I'm missing out on the advantage now. Right, so correct. The, the, the basis travels with you when you buy a new property. Um, so if you bought this property, you know, this $4 million building in 2019, you're looking at, you know, $3.4 million of depreciation. You're taking 120,000 every year. So after four years, right, after five years, right, you've taken $6,000, 600, excuse me, $600,000. Your basis, let's call it, is gonna be 2.8 million, okay? That's what's generally gonna happen. So if you sell that building, right, your basis is gonna carry forward to the 20, that 2 million, um, 800,000, excuse me. Uh, so what's gonna happen at that point? If, and again, the capital gains tax deferred depreciation capture is deferred. If you add more value to your new property, meaning if you don't just transfer, take those funds and buy a new property for you know, what the gain is on the property, you can actually use more funds and keep adding funds to the new property. And those new funds get added to the basis. So yeah, you're going to take that 2.8 million that's going to carry over. Um, and whatever you added to the, the new property is going to be added to that basis. So if you keep doing it that way, you will continually be building your base. Each new property will, you know, have the equity from the property that was relinquished, right? The downlink property and going into the new property will have even, uh, even higher value to it. And so the depreciation will continue to grow as well. Excellent. Yeah. So the key would be, yeah, it does travel, but if you buy a bigger property, you're going to have more to write off. And, or if you add, add improvements to that, that'll also increase your basis as well. Okay. Excellent. No, those are, these these are very helpful. And this is obviously very detailed for the (laughs) listeners, right? It's very, it's a complex strategy, but once, once each individual circumstance or each deal is laid out, it actually, it's just a mathematical equation of what you bought it for. What is your basis? You know, how much improvements have you put in? How much depreciation have you taken so far? And, and then, and then from there, get the cost seg study. So what would be the next steps? Um, Yana, someone says, look, I'm interested. Uh, how, how would one go about either, um, uh, getting an estimate from you or, or scheduling, um, a cost segregation study? So we have people usually reach out to us either when they're under contract 
uh, buying a property or recently have acquired a property. So we'll run the numbers, meaning we'll actually uh, have our engineers look at details of the property and tell you what your projected tax benefits would be. And so we do that as a complimentary service at no fee, no charge uh, for that. Uh, and we will tell you how much it will actually cost to go ahead and do a full uh, study. At that point, we'll send an engineer to the property uh, if you decide to engage us and you know, or whatever. That's when, you know, usually about a six to eight week process of uh, preparing that study, getting all that done. We can definitely do it faster if necessary, but I wouldn't wait to the last minute, uh, especially this time of year. People are starting to wake up and think about March 15th when I have to start filing. Now everyone's uh, waking up and saying, oh, okay, I got to get the cost segregation study done in time. So the report will be ready for my tax returns. And would you mind sharing just a, a general estimate, you know, for like, say, a $4 million deal, what would the cost to have that cost segregation study done? So it's based on the uh, scope of work involved and not on the tax savings, which so it doesn't matter if it's a $4 million property or a $40 million property, uh, the, the actual cost will be pretty much the same uh, if the scope of work is the same. So apartment buildings generally uh, run anywhere between about four to $6,000. That's our fees for, for apartment buildings. Other type of commercial properties, maybe more because there's more work involved, right? Office building, you have to go into every single suite um, you know, retail, et cetera. But very rarely do you find properties that, you know, it's over a $10,000 cost, you know, we're talking about massive commercial properties. And at that point, obviously the, the benefit greatly outweighs. And even on that, on a million dollar property and up, it's almost a no brainer. The amount of tax benefit that's involved for, for such a small, um, service. When would you tell someone, Hey, don't do the cost segregation study. It's not in your benefit. Is there, is there a deal size that's too small or is there a time limit when they're going to be selling here in the new future? It's, or they've owned it for too long. Walk us through where you would say, you know, we'd love to do business with you, but we just don't recommend it given the cost and given your current circumstances. Sure. So several, several scenarios. Um, so number one, the cost, if it's under a half a million dollars is usually not going to be enough benefit there. Um, I would say even before that, the first thing I ask is, you know, well, do you need the extra tax deductions? Because just creating tax deductions that you're not going to be able to use doesn't really help anyone. So that's really the first step. So you have to look at everyone's individual situation. And that's really what we're most concerned about. But the actual property, what will produce the benefits, you know, over, over half a million dollars is certainly going to be a lot of benefit there. Over a million, like I said, it's almost a no brainer. Um, if you're holding it for any less than two years, okay, you're just gonna, you're gonna be playing with uh, that money, right? You're gonna be playing with it, you're gonna have to pay the recapture tax uh, and the partial asset disposition is gonna be a lot less. So there's, you know, you gotta be hit with that. So I'd say a flip, definitely not a good idea. Under two years, usually not a good idea. Holding for long-term, usually yes, a good idea. If you've held a property, if you owned a property for a number of years, and never knew about cost segregation. You can actually do this retroactively um, without having to amend any tax returns. Um, you just fill a form, it's called 3115, 3115 form, which allows you to change the method of accounting, change the method of depreciation from the property. And so going back, you know, even five years or even 10 years uh, can be beneficial depending on the size and the value of the property. Great, great overview. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we're going to uh, wind down here with just uh, two quick questions. Um, now that you're, again, you're educating, you're sharing the knowledge of cost segregation, helping people reduce taxes. Um, how do the people that you work with, and I mean, when I mean work with, I don't necessarily mean Madison Specs, but I mean kind of your, your outer team or your outer tribe, the people that you're helping out, the commercial real estate syndicators, maybe the financial advisors who have their own companies in their own space, but they're leaning on you and, and, you're, you, and asking for your services to help their clients. How are they best leveraging what you do to grow their business? I would say I'm like a, a real giver in a lot of ways. So I go out of my way to help connect people I go out of my way to help help people and whether that's um, on social media, if you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, uh, if you are, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, like it's a good idea because I literally help promote other people all the time. I have a very large network, help connect people. Um, so I think 
that's a lot of what, you know, I enjoy doing. Uh, the business, you know, comes, thank God, this is for like a lot of people say this is like a no brainer. Like it's like, it's, it's very, it's a very easy sell because it's really just about understanding what it is. And they're like, okay, well, yeah, well, why wouldn't I do that? <laughs> I don't want to pay tax. Okay, let's do it. So for me, it allows me the kind of freedom to be able to just help people in, in many other ways, which is something I love to do. Love that. And uh, our last question here, how do, you, how do you stay centered in your values and keep from being discouraged? You know, this, the, uh, the current environment we're in with either news or media or uh, even challenges with, with different, you know, changing laws and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of moving parts. How do you personally kind of stay centered in your values and keep from becoming discouraged? Um, I'm actually a very religious person and I study and I pray and I meditate every single day and I have a, you know, a big family. I spend a lot of time with them. I literally don't pay attention to politics or the news. <laughs> I literally, I don't have a TV. I don't watch YouTube, um, you know, unless it's like purely educational if I need to. And so I don't really get involved in, in all that kind of stuff. So I stay pretty centered just from focusing on what I, my values and what I believe is important. Um, you know, kind of accompanying my religious uh, community and, and lifestyle and beliefs. So I think it's a pretty easy question. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, pray, prayer, meditation, centered on your values. You know, keeping the uh, the noise out by keeping away from TV and, and different distractions. Uh, I think those are all great habits to practice. Well, Yana, I want to thank you for being on our show and sharing your wisdom with our audience. And I want to thank our our audience again for for listening to another episode of Capital Gains Tax Solutions Podcast. You know, as always, we really believe most high net worth individuals and those who help them they struggle with clarifying their capital gains tax deferral options. Hopefully listen to Yana and connecting with him at Madison Specs gives you another strategy or another tool to help you reduce, eliminate um, capital gains tax and also just income taxes as well. As always, we believe not having a clear plan is the enemy. But using a proven tax deferral strategy such as cost segregation um, is the best way to grow your wealth. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks so much.